British sci-fi master Arthur C. Clarke stated that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. He couldn't have been more right. So, let's turn on our exoskeletons and get ready to cast some fireballs. I'm DC Ferguson, author of the Wicked Instruments series, and this is 8 Tips for Technology and Magic. From a practical standpoint, we want to use our real-world history, uh, especially that of the last 2,000 years, as a guideline for the growth and spread of magic and technology on our world. Uh, to that end, we have to consider two things. One, that a creepy old man living in the woods performing resurrections is actually a really problematic issue. Um, think about the concept, maybe one man in 10,000 has achieved the power to pierce the veil of death. Well, there were 200,000 people living in London around 1600, so we've got 20 people that can make death meaningless in one city alone. Uh, guess what their occupation is for the rest of their life? Of course, in the 1600s, London also lost 80,000 people to the plague. Uh, have a magic healer? Guess what never ever ever happens in your world's history? That's right. No plagues, no diseases, and no one dies on accident. And if they do, they get brought back. Seems like a pretty big problem when you start increasing scale, right? Technology's growth in our history has fulfilled a need, but it came with limitations. Yesterday's telegraph became the telephone. The phone took decades to shift to cordless. Then cell phones, now smartphones. So, if you're setting your saga only 40 years into the future, and you have 200-foot robot space protectors, you're going to need to give me a lot of explanation as to how and why there was this sudden technological revolution that sped up the pace to put a man in a robot suit in space. And as you're going to see later, details and long explanations are actually your enemy. The, the problem works both ways. Let's say for a moment that a master craftsman is required to fashion an object, both beautiful and functional, but capable of holding an enchantment. A magical artifact, we'll say. Now, let's say he makes it, takes him only a week. Then a wizard comes along using his decades of knowledge to enchant this object. Now the wearer of this magical device can communicate over long distances to anyone that he needs to send a message to. Look, you just made a pager as an artifact. Uh, magic is wondrous and dependent on whose system you're looking at for inspiration. It can be either chaotic, difficult to control, rare, arduous to learn, or require great deals of intelligence, training, and study. Uh, so a mundane object that duplicates something technology can do is not only trite, but it's incredibly hard to swallow. See, telegraphs had to become phones, and then phones had to become affordable and practical for everyone to buy one. Uh, the same thing happened to cell phones and smartphones and so on, all the while becoming eventually a mass-produced, mass-market item that are made by people who don't even understand how they work. Um, it's an important distinction and a difficult balance to strike, but a general rule here is that in the real world, think about what magic or tech does, how hard it is to produce, and what the impact would be on your world's history to have it. So, now that that PSA is out of the way, we can get to some examples. Herky was waiting for this. The limitations you put on your world's magic or technological systems are often going to be more fun and more satisfying than a long list of everything it can do. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, we can't travel back to the future if we can't generate power from a lightning bolt. We have no control over where we quantum leap to next. Our shields are failing. Uh, this object won't give me what I desire unless I pay for it in blood. See, magic and tech are the same in this regard. The more limits on them, the more it can't do, the better it is. Why? Because, like we talked about in Law & Order, broken systems are where good stories are at. Our heroes or antagonists can break those rules. Uh, Airwolf is the most powerful prototype helicopter in the world, until Red Wolf comes along with a freaking laser. Now the bad guy broke the rules, he's more powerful than the rules said he could be. Now this is a challenge we've been waiting for. Uh, look at Trinity's concern in the Matrix when she tells Neo that he moves like one of the agents. He's breaking the rules of the Matrix and it's scary. Will Neo become one of them? We can say no, of course not, now with you know rose-colored lenses, but back then when this w movie was an unheard of, untested thing, the first time you're watching it is blowing your mind and you have no idea what direction it's going in. There was some real tension there. So now we have a dialogue about what your magic or tech can't do. And it's a good space to explore for your world. Now let's talk about what it can do. Here we're going to do another little dance. 
this is one where we make the magic uh, or sufficiently technological system that does this awesome stuff without feeling contrived. When you look at great stories that employ magic or tech, ask yourself whether it was a system or a plot device. Here's the lens we look through. Using a previous example from one of our other videos, we have Independence Day. The Holy Power book in this movie can see patterns in satellite communications to turn said pattern into a countdown clock, interface with alien technology, and understand their machine language enough to write a virus. This is a plot device. Our heroes win because this object does these things. Um, another one, The Craft. A uh, cult favorite of every 90s emo kid had a magic system that allowed for flying, telekinesis, massive illusions, calling storms, super strength, and generic wishing, basically. Uh, with all this power that four teenage girls picked up over the first semester at a new school, they apparently never learned how to stop the one friend who breaks away when things go too far. So their magic here does whatever the story wants it to do to move the story forward, except kill the hero that's standing in their way. Uh, now contrast this with the first Matrix. The Matrix lets us do all this crazy stuff because it's when, within the confines of a program with rules. Uh, learning to break those rules, you can do whatever you want, including stop the agents, which themselves break the rules of the system at will. This is a near-perfect tech is magic system because you earn the power to break the rules and you can still be punished in the real world for failure. Your body is still vulnerable where you are. Here, the tech is an element of how our stories flow and ebb. It's a tool of the heroes and also their greatest weakness. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Harry Potter here as well, but this one feels like a given. It's very heart and soul as a school to train wizards. Magic is learned and honed, and the plot is actually a story within where this world of wizards exists. So magic here isn't a plot device, we're totally immersed in a world where there are wizards. Uh, we need to understand this distinction as well, so we understand the boundaries we're working in. So now we have flawed systems that can be broken, which are a part of the world and not just some mechanism that moves the story. So let's cast some stuff. Your world has magic or high technology. All right, what is this magic or tech? How does it work? If we're taking the less is more approach, and I really hope you do, then the exact mechanics don't matter. But the method, ah, now that's a different story. Without too many spoilers, uh, the princess and the holy juggernaut uh, Liana Moonbody is a magical bard, so she casts magic through her music, which presents itself in uh, balls of light she can fire from her strings, uh, charms, and mundane things like her morning makeup. All of these things are described as secret notes and sequences she's been tra trained to play to unlock her magic. But when Liana is captured in a prison and chained to a wall without her guitar, how can she cast her spells if, as we've learned to accept that she can? The solution is simple. She uses her voice as the instrument, breaking the system while also staying within the rules of this world. Casting magic or using tech, what matters is repetition and consistency. The plug goes into the back of the head, we're going into the matrix. We hit 88, we time travel. We set right what once went wrong, we quantum leap. But look back at those systems. Remember that when we died in the matrix, we got to be reborn? Remember when we needed to use lightning instead of a nuclear charge? Uh, remember when we leapt without succeeding? What we're talking about here is that once we've established the consistency of how our magic and technology works, the fun we get to have is in the story of how we play with it, mess with it, how our heroes use it differently in clever ways, uh, so that at the end of the day we make our characters grow by thinking outside the box, forming alternate solutions, or outright breaking the system. Now, since we've been talking about that, there's this invisible scale that we slide along. The more your magic or tech needs to be explained, the more useful it becomes. The less we explain it, the more wondrous it becomes. Uh, so how do we explain this example here? Well, the Force. What does it do exactly? Near as we can tell, it gives Jedi's telekinesis, some minor mind control, supernatural perception, uh, naturally adept at wielding the most dangerous swords ever conceived. Uh, they can transcend death, and apparently lightning bolts is also a thing. Now, what does the Force never do? It never wins. 
It never fixes anything by itself. Luke uses the Force to know where to drop the torpedoes, but real people died to get the information of where the weak spot was. He's just the trigger man with a really accurate trigger. He swings the lightsaber, he duels Vader, he wins, but Luke is the wielder of the sword. Let's look at the reverse. Uh, we have a giant space baby that thinks the Enterprise is its mother. It's siphoning off power from the ship like it's feeding. Eventually, life support will fail and everyone dies. Jordy here determines the mix of the energy that the alien likes and devises a theory to change that mixture, thereby souring the milk and the space baby leaves. Here, Jordy is the brains for scientific explanation and uses the technology to solve the problem. The lesson here is we don't want to heavily explain power going off and doing mundane things. That's a waste. But we also don't want wondrous things solving our problems for us because that's just deus ex machina. See those threatening eyes? Well, the title for this one says it all. Guess what the answer is? If you guess yes, you're a winner. And what's your prize? Well, trip right back to your lab to explain to me how it works. If you want a magic or tech in your world to have a unique angle and voice that only you can bring to the table, I'll tell you now, there's no limits. If you think of it, you can do it. The only thing I would challenge you to, to do is to make something I believe in too. I'm going to go with a weird and obscure example for this one because you know I love the deep cuts. Let's take a look at virtuosity. The reason I choose this example is because it's dated. It was tagged along with the cyberpunk VR craze of the late 90s. It has some measure of predictability and a few contrived issues. It sounds like a bad example, right? Well, no, actually. Despite being a grossly dated film, it could easily be re remade tomorrow with updated tech because the plotline and system around the world is solid. Uh, SID 6.7 is a VR police training tool. It's a thinking and learning simulation made up of 150 of the most dangerous killers of all time. It's being tested by Parker, a cop that lost his family to one of the killers in this makeup. He's in jail for killing the bad guy in cold blood, but that's more of an intro. The meat of the story is that Sid 6.7 is in a data storage unit and his creator decides to let him out by putting him in this artificial morphing liquid that can make VR objects come to life. It also regenerates itself by absorbing with contact with glass. Uh, so now Parker has to be let out of prison to hunt the perfect killer, as he's the only one trained to do it. I mean, it's Denzel Washington and Russell Crowe at the start of his career, so it's got some serious actors in it. We've got this mimetic gel that makes him real, but he can be harmed, he bleeds blue, and he's got this weakness in the form of removing the data cube kills the regenerating body. I mean, we have advanced tech, rules, breaking rules, and just enough science to carry us through the story. That's at least an A for effort in my book. Let's do an exercise real quick. Pick something cheesy or cliche that you've seen that uses magic or technology systems. And come on, we both know there are tons of those. So as an exercise, I want you to update it with practicality and put a storyline here where this magic or tech exists, not as a plot device, but as part of the story itself. All the while, we're thinking about the scale and effect of the world so we stay grounded. So here's what I came up with. For centuries, tribes across the world have kept a secret. Their eldest shaman chose one of their own to walk the world, armed with sacred magic of their tribe, to protect the planet from man's catastrophes. Everywhere you look, now there are oil spills and smog. The chosen five feel a sudden call of the planet itself crying out, summoning them to a sacred place in the northern Arctic wastes. Together they must use their powers of wind, water, fire, and life to brave the wilds and meet up with each other, to summon the avatar of the world itself, the only being powerful enough to save the planet from the extinction of all life, can they succeed before it's too late. So, that's my take on Captain Planet. Um, now, I zipped right through this for brevity, but creating backstory and ritual, a framework for shaman magic, a goal in how the powers unfold, we take a really crappy cartoon and bring it to life. I want everybody to sit down, give this one some thought. It's an awesome exercise to imagine what if and inspire some of your own systems. I'm going to cut straight to examples here because you'll see the flaw immediately. Our buddy Green Lantern here has a ring that can make whatever he imagines it can make. The only limitation is what he can conceive of. I don't know about you, but we're all storytellers, right? I've got a pretty damn big imagination. I mean, well endowed, folks. So, that being said, an alien invasion comes to Earth. Imagine a spacesuit. 
flying to space. Imagine a 250-mile-wide Pac-Man that gobbles up their ships like energy pellets. Uh, Superman finally goes insane. Imagine a cage so powerful even Superman couldn't break out of it. You see the problem I'm getting at. Powers that basically function like a wish from a magic genie are terrible for plots, because you're always going to be having your audience asking themselves, well, why did they do this? Why am I smarter than the hero of this story? Now, you can say to yourself, but hey, DC, Green Lantern's power ring has to be recharged. That's a fair limitation. Well, no, it's not, and here's why. That's a false limitation used as a plot device, basically the opposite of good flaws I was describing earlier. See, how much power the ring holds and how much each use of it expends is left to the whim of the writer. Sometimes he can fight for days without recharging, and other times he's running out of juice at the worst possible time. So, the flaw in the system is now the plot device for this boundless power he gets from the ring. And that, my friends, is how we paint ourselves in a corners. Magic and technology are special and unique, and you should treat them as such. Even if they don't take center stage in your story, their presence should always be handled in high regard. Failing to respect either could make them turn into plot devices, and then we get Deus Ex Machina involved, and she'll set your whole story on fire and kill the survivors. She is not messing around. So don't forget to like and subscribe, check me out on the Art of the Arcane blog, and as always, I'm DC Ferguson. Now have fun and get crafting.